And with that, I would like to welcome the Honorable Adam Schiff. All right, well. Sorry, Ann. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for that very warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Salam, my friend, my brother, my cousin. Uh, it is wonderful to join you again and to all of my wonderful friends here at All Saints, uh, to George and Mary, how wonderful to see you uh, and how wonderful to be in your presence. I want to thank uh, Rector Mike Kinman and All Saints, uh, the entire community, for hosting the event tonight. Uh, thank you to the co-sponsors of the event, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, ECAR, and the Islamic Center of Southern California. There's a lot to discuss tonight about how to address the rise of hate and violence, but there's no better antidote to that than love and community, which is represented so well by the gathering here tonight. This audience from diverse faiths and all backgrounds embodies the America that we are fighting for and what makes our community great. I wish this was not such a timely discussion, but after the terrorist attack in El Paso where a white supremacist killed 22 people and injured many more, there is no escaping the clear and present danger of white supremacist violence in the United States and the terrible urgency to confront it. Simply put, it's domestic terrorism, acts of unspeakable violence motivated by a hateful ideology which justifies them as a means to an end. It shouldn't be hard or controversial to say that. After all, if the shooter in El Paso was Muslim, is there any question how the president would describe him? That is the sad reality of the balkanization of information and beliefs in our country, which we must confront head on. El Paso was among the deadliest domestic terror attacks in recent history, but it is part of a larger trend. According to the Anti-Defamation League, in 2008, 39 of 50 killings committed by political extremists were carried out by white supremacists, and eight more were carried out by anti-government extremists. For three years running, the FBI has charted an increase in hate crimes reported by local law enforcement agencies with a 17% jump in the most recent statistics from 2017. I'll start with the simplest, most obvious thing to do, pass gun violence reforms to put in place universal background checks, ban assault weapons, and more. Making guns harder to get and less deadly won't stop hate, but it will save lives. In El Paso, in Dayton, in Gilroy, and in a hundred other communities whose names have now become synonymous with mass gun violence, first responders responded quickly. But when a shooter can fire 30, 40, or 50 rounds in less than a minute, it will never be fast enough. The damage has already been done and the lies have already been destroyed. The shooter in Dayton carried a device previously banned under the assault weapons ban that held 120 bullets. There is no reason anyone should be able to own a device other than to kill as many people as possible, as fast as possible, which is exactly what he did. The House of Representatives has already passed two major gun reforms to expand background checks and to close the so-called Charleston loophole that allowed the killer who murdered nine African-American worshipers at the Emanuel AME Church to purchase a gun he should have been barred from obtaining. Those bills are awaiting action in the Senate and they shouldn't wait any longer. <laughs> Mitch McConnell must stop blocking action and he shouldn't wait until September. He should call the Senate back into session this week.
These bills won't stop every mass shooting, but they would stop some and make others less deadly, and they would save lives among the thousands who die from shootings, suicide, or accidental shootings every year. There is also an urgent need to finally take white supremacist violence seriously as a systemic issue. <laughs> white supremacists share a common ideology and language. They have clearly articulated goals and they congregate and communicate with another, one another in specific hate forums and channels online. And they recruit heavily from disaffected young people, white men who are searching out related content online. These are not lone wolf attacks or isolated incidents as we've seen how attacks have motivated other angry, isolated men to put hate into action. Treating El Paso as if it is unrelated to Pittsburgh or Christchurch is a mistake. Indeed, these attacks share much in common with efforts by ISIS to inspire attackers in Western countries to carry out attacks of their own and with little direction. We need a response that is commensurate with the threat. The federal government is beginning to respond, though not fast enough or with the urgency required. The most recent national counterterrorism counter strategy for the first time made direct reference to domestic terrorism. FBI Director Chris Wray testified last month that the Bureau is conducting 850 active domestic terrorism investigations and made clear that these are a priority. But Congress must act as well. There are a variety of bills in Congress, apart from gun violence legislation, to enhance our efforts against white supremacist violence and to improve data collection for hate crimes, which has lagged for years. In July, the House passed the Intelligence Authorization Act with almost 400 bipartisan votes, a bill that I co-authored this is the annual authorization for the intelligence community, one of my top priorities as chairman of that committee. I was proud that for the first time the bill prioritizes domestic terrorism, requiring annual reporting and analysis to Congress and the public about domestic terror threats. This is vital because the FBI's own hate crime statistics have shown three st straight years of increases through 2017, and there's no indication that there is slowing down. Those numbers rely on law enforcement to submit data to the FBI, and whether because they lack the training or the interest to classify crimes motivated by hatred, we know that many hate crimes motivated in the same way as the El Paso shooter go unreported in the national statistics. In the past, I've urged the FBI to improve training offered to local law enforcement, but more needs to be done, and I expect the House to prioritize these issues. We need quality data on hate crimes, and we also need to train local law enforcement to take them seriously. There's also a role for responsible actors in the online space to decide that they don't want to associate and help spread hate. White supremacist ideology and extremism, of course, predates the internet, but with three recent domestic attacks with clear links to the online forum called 8chan, we can no longer ignore the role that internet, the internet plays in fomenting extremism. I was pleased that its hosting company parted ways with it this morning. More companies in the tech sphere need to act to ensure that the hate populated on sites like 8chan is not spread. But it shouldn't take a mass shooting to spur action. Here's what should happen. Responsible companies can decide not to do business or provide hosting services with sites like this one. And companies like Google can do more to keep extremism off their sites and not point users to it through their algorithms. But we must confront the ugly truth, and that is that in his statements and actions, President Trump has given succor to extremists, white nationalists, and racists. He has called white nationalists at the Charlottesville rally very fine people. 
He attacks immigrants in dehumanizing rhetoric as invaders or an infestation, language echoed by the killer in El Paso. He has called for and implemented a bigoted Muslim ban. Condemnations of white supremacist ideology ring hollow when they are bookended by tweets using the same language that the white supremacists use. I don't expect Trump to change. It's up to us to mobilize and organize and demand better. Leaders from both parties need to step up. America's diversity is our greatest strength, not something to be feared, and we will confine hateful, racist ideologies to where they belong, the dustbin of history. We must stand together as Americans. Nothing will bring back the victims in El Paso or other hate crimes, but we can and must defeat the ideology that took their lives. I'm proud to join you tonight. I'm proud to stand with the faith leaders who are here tonight, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you.